Hello and welcome back to our journey through the history of bread. Today we will be moving on through the bread of the first city dwellers. This was a big step for humanity. So again, a human will be needed. Good thing we have one. Da, look at that, he cleaned his little jacket. Humanity's first city, Uruk, is famous for producing the Epic of Gilgamesh. We here at the Taberna wondered what a quick bready snack would look like to the ancient king. Therefore our goal today is to recreate the Gilgamesh Sandwich. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, bread and beer have a very special position. Enkidu, a comrade of Gilgamesh, is considered a man, not a beast, just because he eats bread and gets drunk on beer. This is also our new excuse when we come home at 4 in the morning. Furthermore, bread was seen as the food of the gods and it played a crucial role, not only in the diet of these early Mesopotamians, but also in their religious rites. So let's have a look at what would go into this bread. Two types of flour were mainly used in Uruk. Barley flour, which was the most commonly used one, and emma flour a successor to the einkorn wheat from the previous video. Salt and water are there as per usual, and since we will be leavening this bread, we need yeast, but not that one. Bioengineered yeast, even when it's in a rustic cake form, is a relatively new invention. The leavening agent has quite some impact on the flavor, so you shouldn't use this either. If you want to experience that is, the Gilgamesh Sandwich. We will be making our own leavening agent. There are two period appropriate leaveners. Beer yeast, the happy byproduct from, well, brewing beer, which we will hopefully do one day, but we don't have the infrastructure for that at the moment. And sourdough starter. Now, some of you might already have a starter at hand, so we've put the instructions for making one in a different video. The starter we make over there will also be the basis of some of the other recipes in future videos in this series. So if you want to make a sourdough starter, just pause this video and go check out the other one. We've linked it in the description below. When you come back, we'll be ready to make dough. So, first, we'll have to get our mise en place ready, starting with, well, the starter. We have our now named starter, which you either already had or made using the other video. We're going to use roughly 180 grams of this. Fridge the remaining 20 grams for the next time you use it. We should be back in about two weeks with a more Egyptian recipe. Today we are making bread from the city of Uru, as this bread would have been the basis of the Gilgamesh Sandwich. For this bread of the early city dwellers, we will need, in addition to the starter you already prepared, 250 grams of barley flour, 100 grams of emma flour, 250 grams of water, 5 grams of salt, 20 grams of sesame oil and 10 grams of honey. Mix your starter and flours into the water, then add the salt, honey and half of the oil. Set aside the other half, we will be needing this later. This will get sticky and make loads of squelching sounds. Do not worry, this is all part of the process, even though it is rather unpleasant. Your dough will, much like with einkorn, resemble a biscuit dough more than it does a present day bread dough. Once it becomes a homogeneous mass and all the flour has been incorporated, pour the dough onto a flat work surface which you've oiled with the remaining sesame oil and start kneading it as best you can. Yes, as best you can, because this dough will not make it easy. Our human was left pining for modern flour as he mashed away at the loose paste that was this dough. Working this dough will bring about flashbacks of kneading einkorn. The experience will be somewhere between massaging an octopus made from the inside of a protostar covered in wet cement and wrangling a huge ball of fresh bubblegum mixed with superglue covered in toffee, while on the surface of a black hole. I have a vivid imagination. Knead this for about 10 minutes, but be aware that you are not manipulating your dough to create a mesh of gluten, since, well, there aren't really enough gluten to mesh. 
If anything, this is just a very thorough mixing, making sure the salt, water and most importantly, your home court yeast gets properly mixed around. Given the rebellious nature of this dough, we very much recommend using a dough scraper to prevent you getting frustrated and being tempted to drown the entire thing in oil. Or worse, after those 10 minutes, the dough will be as homogenous as it will get. Now, put it into a bowl and cover. We have a bowl with a lid, but you can put a damp towel over this if you don't have a lid. Just make sure it doesn't dry out. Now, sit back and behold the miracle of life. Let this stand at room temperature, that is assuming your room is around 22 degrees Celsius, for about 6 hours and witness your homegrown culture do its magic. Oh look, he's asleep. Let's wake him up gently. Now that the dough is ready, it's time for shaping and baking. However, we're going to put ours in the fridge for a night. This is not historically accurate, but it really enhances the flavour. Skip this if you want to be fully authentic. This dough will remain good to go in the refrigerator for about a full day. After that, we found it gets a bit too acidic. In the city of Uruk, there were already many methods of baking available. Breads were baked in domed ovens and in clay tandoor-like ovens called tinuru. These tinuru had a heat source at the bottom, which would heat up the walls. The breads would be stuck to the sides. The lower sides of the loaves would get intensely baked, where the hot air running over the top of the loaves would help with the leavening. Firstly, we will try to recreate tinuru prepared bread. Take all your dough, divide and roll it into roughly 50 gram balls. You can go bigger if you want. We found these to be nicer in small bite-sized bits. The gluten absence will make this feel more like rolling meatballs or a very wet biscuit dough rather than flatbread dough. Give them a light sesame oil coating, after which you can pat and stretch them into your desired thickness. This is entirely to taste. You can use a rolling pin, but we found that this wasn't really needed. Now, however, the lack of gluten actually serves a fun purpose. We know that ancient Sumerians would often cut their breads into interesting shapes, like animals or geometric patterns. So we are going to do the same thing here. Okay, sure. The most convenient way of simulating a tinuru in a domestic kitchen is an oven with a fan and a pizza stone or steel. No, no, don't you go sticking your bread to the sides of your oven now. Preheat your oven to its maximum temperature and let it go for about 30 minutes to an hour. Then put your biscuits onto the heated stone or steel. The fan in the back mimics the fire in the old Tinuro ovens, whereas the base stands in for the heated sides of the oven. We kept our biscuits in for about 5 minutes, but this will depend on your oven. Just keep a good eye on them and take them out when they look ready. And there you have it. Some bread that would befit the inhabitants of the world's first city. Some smaller biscuits might even show the coveted pita pocket. But wait, what if you don't have a convection oven? Not too worry. Plenty of sources indicate there were also ovens, or should we call them hobs, where the bread was placed on the outside, so only the bottom would get heated. To mimic this, we will be using this terracotta dish. But you can use any pan you have at your disposal. Just preheat it gently on medium to medium low heat, and you're good to bake, fry, or whatever. You want to make sure that these breads are a bit thicker. We also added a bit of butter to prevent burning and add some nice flavour. Now, it's finally time to tuck in. However, we know that Mesopotamians love themselves some broth with their bread. We don't want to distract too much from the bread, so here's a quick recipe for an appropriate broth. Toast some fennel and a mixture of coriander, sesame and mustard seeds. Now grind these up into a fine powder and enjoy the smell while you do this, because this aroma is extremely pleasant. Add these to a broth. We are using a homemade beef broth, but feel free to use any broth you have at hand 
or bought in a shop. If you are going to make your own broth, try to stay away from chicken broth as these were a few centuries away from being domesticated. Instead, try getting your hands on pigeon or game fowl and don't add any carrots or pepper. Or do. We won't tell anyone. Now, serve your bread in or alongside your Mesopotamian soup and dig in. While our human enjoys a common meal for the average Arukian, we can get on it. Hang on a minute. We were supposed to make the approximation of a sandwich. This is the Gilgamesh novelty crouton soup or whatever. That doesn't sound nearly as epic as We need to start over. Here we go. A starter flour, water, mix, honey, salt, oil, knead, weight, sleep, bang goes balloon and done. We know the sandwich is a relatively modern invention, but we want to recreate the analog of what a king like Gilgamesh would have eaten when he needed a quick bready snack. One that could have occurred in the city of Uruk and we think fits the bill is onion bread. We don't know if this was a recipe that ancient Sumerians had, but they had all the ingredients, so they might as well. Chop some onions into small chunks and cut up some leek. Before we put these in dough, we're going to fry them up in some butter. We did try putting these in raw, but the results were less than desirable. Give them a nice fry, then season them with the same fennel, mustard, coriander and sesame. Feel free to add some salt, but don't add any pepper. They didn't have that yet. Let this filling cool down a bit. We're still missing something. A strong king like Gilgamesh needs protein. And he probably liked cheese. From ancient cuneiform script, we know that Sumerians had cheese. We don't know exactly what type it was, but we know it's safe to assume it was an acidic goat's or sheep's cheese, quite close to modern day feta. To make this, we will need to start to ferment milk to make a mesophilic starter culture. So head on out and get yourself some raw, unpasteurized, goat's or sheep's milk. This will need to ferment at a stable temperature. Oh dear. Oh, maybe let's keep this for another time. <laughs> we wouldn't want to distract from the uh, bread making process. Roll out half the dough ball. Be very careful though. This stuff tears easily. Keep it well floured and be gentle with it. This is also a good moment to start preheating your oven. Once rolled out, Put your onion and leek mixture on one side and put in some dollops of feta cheese. Yes, that's right, we're making a Sumerian calzone or a pasty, depending on your persuasion. Do we know if Sumerians made these? No. However, we do know that they had a recipe for a sort of meat pie. To bake these, we're going to call on Uruk's domed ovens. Meaning we're just going to use our oven here preheated to maximum. Fold shut the pasty, poke some holes and just pop it in the oven. Leave it in for about 15 minutes. And there it now finally is. The Gilgamesh sandwich. Oh, sorry, I meant the So, how does it taste? After he returned from his GP, our human told me that the taste is simple but balanced. When disregarding historical availability, he would add some tomatoes. And this concludes our chapter on humanity's first forays into leavened bread. The people of humanity's first city saw bread as a gift by the gods. This divine position has stuck with bread. And this really makes sense when recreating old starters. People were adding water and flour together and without any visible input, it would start changing and growing. Now, none of us here are anthropologists, but it's not a far leap to see how early humans saw leavened bread as magical or even divine. We also learn that our ancestors must have really liked Emma and Barley, since we know that they had access to bread wheat. Yes, they did. It never really took off though. Modern day bread wheat only became dominant under the Romans, but that's for another time. Please join us in two weeks when we continue our journey and move on to ancient Egypt. We really appreciate constructive feedback in the comments and we'll be eternally grateful for liking and subscribing. 
Thank you for watching.